Now and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Mm -hmm. Blessed Lord, who has caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant that we may in such wise hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience and comfort of thy holy word, we may ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which thou hast given us in our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Mm -hmm. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Mm -hmm. Now, last week, we learned all about Solomon coming to the throne uh, and uh, asking God for the gift of wisdom. And we saw an example of his great wisdom uh, in that he uh, was able to make his Solomonic judgment about uh, the baby, which, uh, uh, which mother did the baby belong to. But it's very striking now he goes on to do the most important thing that Solomon does in his reign, which is to build the holy temple. And Solomon ruled over all the kingdoms from the river to the land of the Philistines and as far as the border of Egypt. Uh, so uh, the author of the book of Kings sets out this vast kingdom really for Solomon, the river meaning the Euphrates, um, the land of the Philistines, um, which uh, is modern day Gaza uh, and to the border of Egypt. It's possible that this is a bit of a kind of exaggeration, but Solomon certainly does live at peace. Um, and um, perhaps rather than ruling directly over some of this territory, it's rather that, you know, he's the, he's the biggest guy in the area, uh, at least among the little guys, you know, <laughs> there's still uh, big empires beyond those borders. They offered tribute and served Solomon all the days of his life. And Solomon's fare for a single day was 30 cores of fine flour and 60 cores of plain flour, 10 fatted oxen and a 20 pasture fed oxen and 100 sheep besides deer and gazelle and roebuck and fatted geese. I don't think he was eating all of this himself. Um, but it's a demonstration of how big his court was, that he has an established bureaucracy. He has uh, a seat of government. A core, apparently, um, is a, a large measure so that 30 cores would have been hundreds of pounds. So it's telling us, you know, not only did he gain tribute from all these vassals round about, but in fact, um, he, he was, you know, uh, able to feast and, and to live well and to support uh, his underlings. For he held sway over all that was west of the river, from Tifshatsar as well as Gaza, over all the kings west of the river. And he had peace on all sides round about. And Judah and Israel dwelled secure, <clears throat> each man under his vine and under his fig tree, from Dan to Beersheba, all the days of Solomon. It's a lovely picture, isn't it? Each man under his vine or under his fig tree, um, dwelling secure and in peace. And Solomon had 40,000 horse stalls for his chariots and 12,000 horsemen. And those prefects provisioned King Solomon and all who were adjoined to Solomon's table, each one for his month, they let nothing lack. Remember last week we heard how he appointed prefects in the 12 different regions and they each has their own month. And they would bring the barley and the straw for the horses and for the chargers to the place where each was, each man according to his regimen. And God gave very great wisdom and discernment to Solomon and breadth of understanding like the sand that is on the shore of the sea. And Solomon's wisdom was greater than the wisdom of all the Easterners and all the wisdom of Egypt. And he was wiser than all men, than Ethan the Ezraite, and Hermon, and Calcol, and Dada, the sons of Mahol, and his fame was in all the nations round about. And you might wonder, well, who are all these other wise people? We don't know who they all are, but the first two, um, that are referred to, uh, we do know who they are. Ethan the Ezraite 
and He-Man, they are actually mentioned in the Psalms. So Psalm uh, 87, if I can find it, it says, a song, a psalm of the sons of Kera to the choir master, according to Mahala Lenanath, a mascal of Heman the Ezraite. So not all the psalms are attributed to David. Some of them, um, these would have been, if you like, choristers in the temple or members of the chapel royal. And it's the psalm that begins, O Lord my God, I call for help by day. I cry out in the night before thee. Let my prayer come before thee. Incline thy ear to my cry. Uh, so that's written by Himan. And uh, the other uh, psalm that uh, is also um, mentioned there, which is written by the other one, um, uh, whose name is Ethan the Ezraite. Uh, that's Psalm 88. Sorry, Psalm 8, uh, yes, it's Psalm 88. A mascal of Ethan the Ezraite. I will sing forever of thy steadfast Lord, O Lord, forever. With my mouth I will proclaim thy faithfulness to all generations. Uh, one of my favourite psalms, and in fact, um, my school motto was the first line of that psalm. Misericordia su Domini in aeternum cantabo. I shall sing forever of the mercies of the Lord. So it's nice to know who wrote it, isn't it, and uh, who he was. And he spoke 3,000 proverbs. Well, that's why we attribute the book of Proverbs to Solomon. Um, and his poems came to 5,000. Gosh, I can't think of anything worse than knowing somebody who wrote 5,000 poems. He might be reading to you all the time. <laughs> Here's one of my poems. But um, Solomon maybe was busy with other things because, and he spoke of the trees from the cedar that is in Lebanon to the moss that springs from the wall. And he spoke of beasts and birds and creeping things and fish. And from all peoples they came to listen to Solomon's wisdom, from all the kings of the earth who had heard of his wisdom. There's a beautiful picture of this. He's a real polymath, you know. He not only can write great poetry and speak proverbs, but in fact, you know, he's an expert on flora and fauna and beasts and birds and fish. You know, he knows about everything. And so people come to listen to Solomon's wisdom. And Hiram, king of Tyre, sent his servants to Solomon, for he had heard that they had anointed him king in his father's stead. For Hiram was friendly toward David always. We know that already. Um, and in fact, David had already sent off for some of the provisions to be used for the temple from Hiram during David's lifetime. And, Dave, and, so, and Solomon sent to Hiram saying, You yourself knew of David my father that he could not build a house for the Lord his God because of all the fighting that was all around him until the Lord should set, him, set them under his foot soles. And now... The Lord my God has granted me rest all around. There is no adversary nor evil chancing. And I am about to build a house for the name of the Lord my God. As the Lord spoke to David his father saying, Your son whom I put in your stead on your throne, he shall build the house for my name. Very important prophecy. It's a house for God's name, not for a statue of him not for an idol to be set up, but where God's name will be hallowed. Moses sought to know God's name. He said, this is the name by which I will be known for every generation. And in fact, that name only fully comes to live among men uh, in the descendant of David and Solomon, um, in our Lord, who has the holy name of Jesus. And that prophecy is echoed um, in what St. Joseph is told, you will give him a name, you shall call him Jesus. Our Lady is told the same by the angel Gabriel. And so um, 
we can think of our Lord as the fulfillment. He's the true temple, the true presence of God, the home for the name of God. And when we speak his name, we are entering into that relationship with him, which only begins uh, and is inchoate and, in, and prophesied by the Holy Temple. And now charge that they cut down cedars from Lebanon and my servants will be with your servants and the wages of your servants I shall give you whatever you say for you yourself know that there is no man among us who knows how to cut down trees like the Sidonians. Solomon's actually being quite crafty here he's making you know friendly relationships with Hiram but he also says and I'll set my men to help but actually what they'll do is they'll learn so Solomon is also in the process of, of inculcating um, knowledge in his own people. And it happened when Hiram heard Solomon's words that he greatly rejoiced and he said, Blessed is the Lord today that he has given David a wise son over this large people. It's a striking thing there that Hiram, who is not an Israelite, who is not a member of the chosen people, that he blesses the Lord, the God of Israel. And something we'll see next time when Solomon has actually built the temple, although it is the temple of the Jewish nation um, and only they can approach near into the holy places. Nevertheless, Solomon says that it is a house of prayer for all peoples. And there's the sense that the temple demonstrates not just Solomon's wisdom and, and his glory, but much more than that, God's glory, so that it will draw all uh, to God, to the Lord. And Hiram sent to Solomon, saying, I have heard what you sent to me. I will meet all your desire in cedar wood and in cypress wood. My servants will come down from Lebanon to the sea, and I will turn the wood into rafts to the sea, to the place that you will tell me, and it will break it up there, and you will bear it off. And you, on your part, will meet my desire to provide the bread of my house. So Hiram also uh, strikes a good deal. He says, and in addition to what you suggested paying, you can feed me uh, and feed my servants. And so Hiram gave to Solomon cedar trees and cypress trees and all he desired. And Solomon gave to Hiram 20,000 cores of wheat as provision for his house and 20,000 cores of fine pressed oil. Thus would Solomon give to Hiram year after year. And the Lord had given wisdom to Solomon as he had spoken to him. And there was peace between Hiram and Solomon and the two sealed a pact. And King Solomon exacted forced labour from all Israel and the forced labour came to 30,000 men. And this is the dark side of Solomon, that actually he can only build this house, which replaces the Mishkan, the tabernacle, by forcing slaves from his own people. And whereas with the tabernacle, every uh, Israelite made the same contribution, half a shekel, and it was a collaborative e effort here it's being imposed from above the temple. Um, uh, people are pressed into service. And he sent them to Lebanon, 10,000 a month. By turns they were a month in Lebanon and two months at his house. And Adoniram was over the forced labour. And Solomon had 70,000 porters and 80,000 quarriers in the mountains, besides Solomon's prefect officers who were over the labour. 3,300 who held sway over the people during the labour. And the king gave the order and they moved great stones, costly stones, for the foundation of the house, hewn stones. And Solomon's builders and Hiram's builders and the Gebelites carved and ready to the timber and the stones to build the house. That's chapter five. Now chapter six, I thought, oh, it'd be a bit boring it's all measurements and you know architectural details and actually the more I looked at it I thought actually no, this is quite important so I hope you find it interesting too and it happened 
in the 480th year after the Israelites came out of Egypt, in King Solomon's fourth year in the month of Ziv, which is the second month, that he set out to build a house to the Lord. Now, uh, the number is very significant. It's a, perhaps an idealised number, 480 years from the Exodus. Haven't we covered a lot of ground? Um, and that, of course, the mathematicians among you will tell, tell me that it is 40 times 12. Uh, so it's a kind of it's a very ideal number. Okay, so it's 40 and 12 uh, are important numbers. And the month of Ziv, which is the second month, you wouldn't think that they'd have to explain it was the second month. Surely they'd know that. But actually, Solomon um, doesn't use the traditional Hebrew way of describing the months. He doesn't. They just said the first month, the second month, the third month. And he uses these Canaanite terms. I suppose it's something they've picked up from Canaan. But it does kind of suggest, you know, Solomon is beginning a new calendar. Um, and, you know, there have been regimes that have done that in the past. You think of, you know, Caesar Augustus having a month named after himself, or Julius Caesar having a month named after him, or in the French Revolution, you know, they started from the year one. Uh, so did Mussolini. If you look at the uh, railway station in Milan, it says it's built in the whatever fascist year. Um, and Solomon <laughs> does a similar thing. Later on, um, because you, uh, you, we see that actually um, the Jewish people adopt a different system, not the biblical one, not the Canaanite one, uh, but the Babylonian months when they go into exile in Babylon. Uh, and so, in fact, when you talk about uh, those months that they, they still use today, they come from Babylon. And that's why it explains which is the second month, because those reading this would not be familiar with that. And the house that King Solomon built was 60 cubits in length and 20 in width and 30 cubits in height. Now, what is a cubit? Apparently, a cubit is from the tip of the fingers to the elbow. Now, of course, people have different lengths of arms, but that, just like our, our feet, you know, they're, they're, it's a general measurement. Um, and this is describing just the central building of the temple, not its courtyard and, and the, a kind of a, like a cloister around it. According to Robert Alter, this would be less than 120 feet, perhaps as little as 100 feet which makes Solomon's temple a relatively intimate structure. Um, to put it in context, the tower of our church is 147 feet high. Um, so from our standards, this wouldn't be like a big cathedral, more like you know, a church in a town. But the contrast with the tabernacle, of course, is very great. And also, as we'll see, the quality of the materials used. Uh, would have made it very impressive. And this is just the central structure. I will show you some pictures in a moment which will help you to visualise this. And the outer court that was in front of the great hall of the house was 20 cubits in length along the width of the house, 10 cubits in width along the house. And he made inset and latticed windows for the house. So Solomon uses the very latest technology, a window, um, to let light into the house. And he built on the wall of the house a balcony all around the walls of the house in the great hall and in the sanctuary, and he made supports all round. And the lowest balcony was five cubits in width, and the middle one six cubits in width, and the third one seven cubits in width. And he set recesses in the house all round on the outside so as to fasten nothing to the walls of the house. Let's look at a picture because I think <laughs> if I were to ask you to draw that now, you never know, you might struggle. <laughs> Whereas, here we see a little plan. So, um, first of all, there is the entrance and there's a porch. 
and that's um, so that's ten cubits. That's oops, oh what have I done? Uh, that's thirty five cubits, and then you've got the the main sanctuary in there. And we'll look at what's inside it later on, and then you've got the holy of holies, and then on the sides of it, what are described there as balconies. And these are, if you like, these are ancillary rooms all around. And they're attached by ledges. That's why the top story is bigger than the bottom story, because they don't want to make any holes in the stonework of the sanctuary itself. So that gives you an initial idea. A picture might make it even more clear. Now, of course, some of these things are subject to interpretation. But what you have there is the temple, there's an outer courtyard, and there's this is called the, the Molten Sea. And that's a, a great big um, container of water from which the water can then be put in these smaller ones. We'll see these described in a moment. And they're on wheels, so they can be taken around for the different ablutions. There you can see where the altar of the sacrifices, where the animals are sacrificed, and then within the temple, within the sanctuary itself, you have the altar of incense, and then the Holy of Holies into which only the priest can enter. I hope that picture just kind of does help a bit. And then there's another picture showing the interior, or somebody's idea anyway. Yeah, lots of gold, isn't there? And it's, it, uh, they like their bling. Uh, so, let's just have a little more explanation. And, um, where did we get to? Oh, yes, here we are. And the house, when it was built, of whole stones brought from the quarry it was built, and no hammers, nor axes, nor any iron tools were heard in the house when it was built. Um, we heard exactly the same in Exodus when they built the altar. You shall not build them of hewn stones, for your sword would be brandished over it and profane it. So it means that all the cutting of the stones and their dressing has to be done at the quarry, and the building of the temple is carried on in this very silent manner. It's, it's a sacred undertaking. The entrance at the middle support was on the right side of the house and on spiral stairs they would go up to the middle chamber and from the middle to the third. So these are the rooms around the balconies and it's interesting isn't it traditionally um, English churches you always had an entrance on the south side um, just like the temple was entered from the south side. And he built the house and finished it, and he panelled the house with cedar beams and boards. So just, you know, as uh, I, I gather panelling is coming back into fashion. Um, so, you know, which is good to know, you know, this house, you, know, it's, you wait 300 years and suddenly it's the latest thing again. Um, and Solomon had these very fine cedar panelling all around. And he built the balcony over all the house, five cubits in height, and it held the house fast in cedar wood. And the word of the Lord came to Solomon, saying, This house that you build, if you walk by my statutes and do my laws and keep all my commands to walk by them, I shall fulfil my word with you that I spoke to David your father and I shall dwell in the midst of the Israelites, and I shall not forsake my people Israel. So this God will live among you here in this temple if you fulfill his word. And Solomon built the house and finished it. And he built the walls of the house from within with cedar supports from the floor of the house to the ceiling, overlaid it with wood within, and he overlaid the floor of the house with cypress supports, and he built the 20 cubits from the corners of the house with cedar supports from the floor to the walls, and he built it from within the sanctuary, the Holy of Holies. I should say that the Holy of Holies 
is thought to have been on the protruding rock on the top of Mount Moriah, believed to be the same place where Abraham had offered Isaac. Um, and so it's the place, you know, where David then bought the threshing floor of Araunah the Jebusite um, when the plague was averted over, um, uh, over the city of Jerusalem, where he saw the angels sheathing his sword. And so it's, it's, it's already a holy place. And the house was 40 cubits, which was the great hall. And the cedar was the house, and cedar was the house inside, a weave of birds and blossoms. So into this wood, this stone is carved birds and flowers. Everything was cedar, no stone was seen. So the whole thing is panelled. And the sanctuary in the innermost part of the house, he read it to place there the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. And before the sanctuary, 20 cubits in length and 20 cubits in width and 20 cubits in height, he overlaid with pure gold and he overlaid the altar with cedar. So it's a perfect cube, everything is 20 cubits, and the altar, which is the altar of incense, is overlaid with cedar. And Solomon overlaid the house from within with pure gold, and he fastened gold chains in front of the sanctuary and overlaid it with gold. And the house he overlaid with gold till the whole house was finished. And the whole altar which was in the inner sanctum, he overlaid with gold. And in the sanctuary, he made two cherubim of olive wood. One cherub with a five cubit wing and the other wing five cubits, 10 cubits from one edge of its wings to the other. And the second cherub was 10 cubits, a single measure and shape for both cherubim. The height of the one cherub was 10 cubits and the same for the second cherub. And he placed the cherubim within the inner chamber and the wings of the cherubim were spread and the wing of the one touched the wall and that of the second cherub touched the other wall and their inner wings touched wing to wing and he overlaid the cherubim with gold. Now, if I say to you, oh, there were these cherubs, I'm willing to bet that the first thought that comes into your mind is those flying babies with fat bottoms, which is what we have imagined cherubs to be ever since uh, the Renaissance. However, um, this is an alien interpretation, you know, interpolation into Western art, um, probably borrowed from, you know, Roman cupids and so on. Um, cherubim are not like that at all. And um, if we go back to how the scriptures describe cherubim, they're far from being, you know, um, cute little uh, uh, sort of uh, putty. Uh, they're terrifying uh, messengers of the Lord, guards to defend uh, uh, the holy and to repel what is unholy. We first encounter cherubim in the scriptures in the book of Genesis, when uh, the cherubim are stationed uh, in the Garden of Eden to guard the entrance when Adam and Eve are expelled from the garden. And we can only really understand the Holy Temple by thinking of Eden, because Eden, the, Adam and Eve are thrown out of it to the east and the entrance is guarded with a flaming sword by the two cherubim. To get into the temple, you come from the east to the west and the Holy of Holies contains these two great cherubim. In fact, that's not the only place that they're found. I mean, they're enormous. They're um, you know, 10 cubits across. They're large things. They're not... You know, little, little um, what we think as, as, as cherubic uh, figures. In Exodus, they also have two cherubim in the tabernacle. They're not as big as these, 
um, you know, Solomon just kind of um, supersizes everything uh, in order to uh, magnify uh, the praise of God. Um, and they also have um, uh, the cherubim already on the ark. So we've already heard in the book of Samuel uh, the beautiful expression, the Lord who sits upon the mercy seat above the cherubim. Uh, and that also uh, comes into the Psalms. Uh, so I can find the correct page. My marking of it worked. Almost certainly it didn't. Um, I'll have to uh, find my reference. Um, Psalm 80. O oh Lord, the... Um, Oh, here we are, yes. Psalm 79. Give, give ear, O shepherd of Israel, thou who leadest Joseph like a flock, thou who art enthroned upon the cherubim, shine forth. And we also hear exactly the same expression, and these are liturgical psalms for those coming to the temple. Um, in uh, Psalm 98, is that right? I do apologise, the writing is so small in, in here, this is my excuse. Um, the Lord reigns, let the peoples tremble, he sits enthroned upon the cherubim, let the earth shake. Now if you see a Michelangelo cherub, you don't think, oh, how scary. Um, uh, but these cherubim, they're going to make people terrified. They're going to make the earth shake. So what do they look like? Well, um, we get a little bit more idea um, if we go to the book of the prophet Ezekiel. And he describes the cherubim very carefully to us. He says in the first chapter, he has a vision. Um, and I looked, behold, a stormy wind came out of the north and a great cloud with brightness all around it and fire flashing forth continually. And in the midst of the fire, as it were, gleaming bronze. And from the midst of it came the likeness of four living creatures. And this was their appearance. They had the form of men, but each had four faces, and each of them had four wings. Their legs were straight, and the soles of their feet were like the sole of a calf's foot. And they sparkled like burnished bronze. Under their wings, on their four sides, they had human hands. And the four had their faces and their wings. Thus, <coughs> their wings touched one another. And they went straight forward without turning as they went. And the likeness of their faces, each had the face of a man in front, the four had the face of a lion on the right side, the four had the face of an ox on the left side, and the four had the face of an eagle at the back. Such were their faces, and their wings were spread out above. Each creature had two wings, each of which touched the wing of another, while two covered their bodies, and each went straight forward, Wherever the spirit would go, they went without turning as they went. So these are terrifying creatures with four faces. Of course, from this vision of Ezekiel, we get the symbols for the four evangelists. Matthew as a winged man, uh, John as an eagle, um, Luke with the winged ox, uh, and uh, Mark with the winged lion. If we look here, you get an idea of what the cherubim would have looked like. How do we know this? Because this is a Phoenician cherubim from the same period. Um, uh, and and um, uh, we know that Solomon and Hiram were friends, so it's likely that there's an overlap of, of understanding. According to uh, St Gregory the Great, who's then followed by St Thomas Aquinas, the cherubim are the second highest in the order of the, of the nine choirs of angel. It's the seraphim at the very top, but the cherubim are the next down. So they are purely spiritual, very um, awe-inspiring, uh, fearful um, creatures. Here is a Christian representation of the four wings. There's a, got more than four wings actually there, hasn't it? But anyway, um, uh, and you get another image here. I think this is very beautiful. 
with the, the symbols of the evangelists from Ezekiel there, uh, the ox, the lion, the eagle and the man. And I think there's much more of a sense of, of this being an, an awesome creature there. Here, I quite like this, is a, 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 a 12th century French illumination of what they think the cherubim looked like on top of the ark. Um, so there are different interpretations about the faces of the cherubim. In rabbinic tradition, they were thought to be childlike. And I think that's probably where then that translation into the putty Comes, you know, that they were seen as pure and innocent, and so they became little babies, but somehow they lost all of their fearsome quality in that way. Um, in the Talmud, it says that one was male and the other was female, and that they were embracing, and that actually when Israel saw uh, this, it was a demonstration of how God loved Israel like a man loves his wife. And so there was a very kind of graphic image there. Um, again, there were differing views on, on whether that was the case. And also whether the cherubim faced inwards or outwards. There seems to be a, con a contradiction between Exodus and Kings. And again, another interpretation was, well, when Israel was faithful, they faced inwards, and when they, when they weren't, they faced outwards, and they somehow miraculously moved round. But um, I think the spiritual sense of the Holy of Holies being the return to Eden, the return to a relationship with God. But of course, it was something which only the high priest did once a year to go into the Holy of Holies on behalf of the people when he had been purified um, in many ways. Whereas when our Lord dies upon the cross, the veil of the temple is torn in two. The presence of God is laid open. And uh, as we read, particularly in the letter to the Hebrews, um, he takes us with him into the sanctuary, not made by human hands. Uh, Hebrews also refers to the cherubim in chapter 9, it says, Now even the first covenant had regulations for worship and an earthly sanctuary, for a tent was prepared, the outer one, in which were the lampstand and the table and the bread of the presence. It is called the holy place. Behind the second curtain stood a tent called the Holy of Holies, having the golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides with gold, which contained a golden urn holding this, the manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant. Above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot now speak in detail. I think not just because they're so complex, but because there is a mystery and... and um, uh, a, a reverence which has to be shown to them. So cherubim are quite important um, and uh, God is enthroned upon the cherubim. And all the walls of the house all round he wove in carvings of intertwined cherubim. So they go all around, you know, these images and they're on the curtains as well. And palms and birds within and without. And the floor of the house he overlaid with gold within and without. And the entrance of the sanctuary he made of olive wood doors, five sided capitals and doorposts, and two olive wood doors. And he wove on them a weave of cherubim and buds, and overlaid them with gold. And he worked the gold down over the cherubim and the palms. And he did the same for the entrance of the great hall, four sided olive wood doorposts. And the two doors were cypress wood, and the two supports of one door cylindrical, and the two supports of the other door cylindrical. And he wove cherubim and palms and buds 
and overlaid them with gold directly over the incising. And he built the inner court in three rows of hewn stone and a row of cut cedars. In the fourth year did he lay the foundations of the Lord's house in the month of Ziv. And in the eleventh year, in the month of Bull, which is the eighth month, he finished the house in all its details and in all its designs, and he was seven years in building it. So again, with the finishing, it's finishing the month of Bull, and that has to be explained, the eighth month, because that's not a Hebrew term. And so the Temple of Solomon takes seven years to build. We're perhaps more familiar with images of the second temple, um, which was larger, but this is the first temple, and it's during, well, the first temple stands that most of the Old Testament actually is written. So it's, a, it's if you like, the, the golden period in, in Israel's life, and that place of meeting between God and man. And the temple remains important to us, although it doesn't, doesn't stand anymore. Um, the first Christians did go to worship in the temple. We hear about Peter and John going up to the temple at the third hour and so on. Um, but the temple and learning about the temple points us to Christ, who is the meeting place between God and man, who is the lamb of sacrifice, who is the one who reveals God's name. To us. So we will hear a little bit more about that next time uh, and then even more exciting we'll have a visit of the Queen of Sheba which uh, is the other famous thing about Solomon. Any questions? It was more interesting than you might think wasn't it? <laughs> I think there might be one more picture I haven't shown you yet. I'll pass it around because it's a little difficult to see, but it gets the idea of um, Christ and the temple and of the, what cherubim were really like. Yes, the window, the angel's window in All Saints North Street, yes. supposed to show the name yes. of this. Ah, oh, yes, yes. yes. Um, I can never remember quite what they all are. Well, it's certainly the order, angels, archangels, thrones, dominations, powers. Principalities, cherubim, seraphim, I told you there's one missing. Yes. Dominions, is that what I yes, understand? Dominions. Very good. Do modern synagogues try to copy the. Yes, so the ark, which is where, of course, the Torah scrolls are, I believe, often has cherubim uh, on either side, or, or, or you know, so that you have the sense that. Uh, the, the, temple is not there but the Torah contains what the temple contained in a sense um, and modern Jews would say that even though the temple hasn't existed for 2,000 years but by reading about it and learning about it you can acquire the same merit as you would have by going up to the temple when it stood. Yes, I think yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> Very good. So, uh, I shall finish with a prayer. On my I pray thee, loving Jesus, that as thou hast graciously given me to drink in with delight the words of thy knowledge, so thou wouldst mercifully grant me to attain one day to thee, the fountain of all wisdom and to appear for ever before thy face. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.